Uh, okay. Hi, everyone. Today, I'm lucky enough to be joined by today's author, the author of today's text, Dr. Nicole Charles, Assistant Professor of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, Feminist Studies in Culture and Media in the Department of Historical Studies at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, who holds also a graduate appointment in the Women and Gender Studies Institute at the University of Toronto, and who earned their PhD uh, in Women and Gender Studies from the University of Toronto as well. And her work engages cultures of care, healing, techno-science, anti-racism, and colonialism. And today's text, Suspicion, colon, Vaccines, Hesitancy, and the Effective Politics of Protection in Barbados. So welcome, Nicole, and thank you for coming uh, and joining me to do this. Thank you so much for having me. So as a starting point, I would just like to ask, how would you summarize your book, Suspicion, for an audience who's, who might be unfamiliar with the text? So I started this project, and I mean, I'm sure we'll get into this a bit, but thinking to myself, what are we to make of Afro-Barbadians hesitancy toward the human papilloma HPV um, virus vaccine? And in the book, I argue that hesitancy toward the HPV vaccine in Barbados, which is vernacularized by Afro-Barbadians as suspicion, is a generative affect or affective relation. And it's one that's emergent from the multi-scale tensions and circuits of the colonial and by extension post-colonial state. And I make this argument through with an in conversation with transnational feminist scholarship. And this included 11 months of ethnographic analysis in Barbados to situate Afro-Barbadian suspicions of the vaccine within much longer cultural and spatial and temporal genealogies. Ultimately, what the book asserts is that suspicion is generative and it is a palimpsest of the long racialized history of transatlantic slavery in Barbados. So the book really complicates mainstream narratives of irrationality that exist behind the concept of vaccine hesitancy to reveal the racialized and gendered and even heteropatriarchal tropes that a term like hesitancy can perpetuate. No, that's... Fantastic. And it's been a long time that you've been pursuing this topic. Do you, uh, could you describe the history of it uh, from your PhD or earlier up till uh, the time that you published the book? Yeah, so many different starting points. But since you asked about PhD, we can start there. So I did my PhD in the Women and Gender Studies Institute at the University of Toronto, as you mentioned, and this program has strengths in transnational feminism. So here I was trained in transnational feminist methods, which take as a starting point that knowledge about cultural and social events can be most effectively generated if we foreground questions of race and gender and sexuality and conquest and capitalism and colonialism. And transnational feminism teaches us how crucial it is to follow ideologies not only across place, but across time. So really bringing into proximity what we might think of as historical processes like colonialism with contemporary quote unquote social formations. And so we can think of transnational feminists and Jackie Alexander's invocation of the notion of palimpsestic time, which she draws on others to flesh out really evoking the image of a parchment, right? That has been inscribed multiple times and that retains traces of previous texts. Or we might think of Lisa Lowe's emphasis on following the ways that ideologies reach back into colonialism and stretch forward into the now. So in my dissertation, I was really interested in understanding the knowledges and experiences that comprise Barbadian parents' hesitancy toward this vaccine and how this hesitancy was emerging alongside contemporary efforts to promote the vaccine 
and mitigate hesitancy and simultaneously how they were emerging in the wake of the region's history, right, of racialized biopolitical projects and attitudes towards sex and respectability politics. And so it was these curiosities that I took with me when I first began fieldwork in Barbados in 2015. And I kind of describe it as a transnational feminist ethnography. And so what this looked like was me looking to cultural artifacts like Caribbean radio talk shows and political satire websites to see how folks were really engaging with this issue of vaccine hesitancy. And then for me to understand how medical folks and professionals were promoting the vaccine and attempting to counter hesitancy, I conducted interviews with nurses and doctors across each of the island's public health clinics, and also with vaccine hesitant parents and adolescents to whom the vaccine was targeted. So this is kind of the language that I used when I first arrived and how I framed my research ethics, right? Before I came to understand this vernacularization of hesitancy as suspicion. No, oh, that's that's fantastic. And I remember reading in the in in the introduction that you you highlighted that one of the limitations that you confronted or one of the barriers that you confronted in your interviews was that you really were only able to interview middle class Barbadian women. How do you think that this demographic might have differed from other socio socioeconomic groups in that context? Yeah, so this kind of came about the focus on middle class Barbadians because of the way that I relied on, you know, snowball sampling and then and word of mouth to connect with participants. So not so much with doctors and nurses, but with the teenagers and the parents with whom I spoke. And this resulted in a kind of a consistent distribution of folks across class, specifically middle-class Afro-Barbadians. So while there were, of course, variations across these folks in terms of, you know, their occupations and socio-political beliefs, they all responded to my call, again, that was seeking to speak to parents who were hesitant or ambivalent about the HPV vaccine. And I share that even though this was kind of a very specific sample because I was able to speak to the public health nurses who worked in the public health polyclinics across the island through which the vaccine was disseminated. I was really able to understand the insights and perspectives of Barbadians' reactions to the vaccine more broadly. So across class, um, Barbados is over 90% Black. So, you know, the majority of Barbadians are of African descent. And I think to speak to your question a bit in terms of how these demographics might differ specifically in terms of their relationship to the vaccine, it's hard to, it's hard to say without having spoken to them. However, because the vaccine was being offered through the government's national vaccination program rather than through individual private doctor's offices. So this was done, but to a very small extent because of the prohibitive cost of the vaccine. So that meant that only a few local physicians offered it privately and getting a sense of Barbadians engagements and feelings and thoughts towards the vaccine through nurses and through their engagements with Barbadians at the polyclinics was really kind of a, a great way to go about understanding popular thought across the island. Yeah. Uh, and you also reflected on your own positionality here uh, because you yourself are a Trinidadian Canadian university researcher studying in Barbados. And how do you think that this position might have affected uh, your process, your research process in that context? Yeah, you know, going in to do this research as a doctoral student, and I mean, I'm not saying that doctoral students are naive, but I was naive <laughs> as a doctoral student going to Barbados in thinking that because I looked like the people I was interviewing as a Black woman and being from Trinidad, having an accent from the Caribbean, that that would mean I had this natural affinity with the people I was interviewing and that that would make them more comfortable speaking with me. And I just got a very immediate reality check. So 
in the book, I share the story of being called a Trinidadian rather than a Trinidadian. And this is a nickname that, you know, is in part spoken in jest and in part meant to allude to the feelings that many Barbadians hold about the influx of intra-regional and international corporations and investments and interests on the island. And specifically in this case, they're referring to Trinidadian takeovers of big local banks and supermarkets in ways that some perhaps felt was duplicitous. And so there was a bit of distrust in speaking to me. Um, and I came to learn eventually that this distrust was a form of suspicion that was attaching to me as a Trinidadian. And it wasn't all that different from the same affects of suspicion that attached to the vaccine or to other biotechnologies like proposed biometric screening machines. All of these things are being offered, you know, including Trinidadian takeovers in this all too familiar name of optimization and care and growth and betterment, essentially biopolitics, right? Yeah, absolutely. And just for clarity, what, what are these biometric uh, screening machines? So these were proposed screening machines at each of the ports of entry to Barbados, essentially like fingerprinting machines uh, that the right. government was wanting to introduce. But Barbadians were really adamant that locals shouldn't have to go through this process. And this was something that the government had tried to introduce in years prior, and it was shut down. And again, it didn't go through during my time there. And I don't believe it's something that's active now either. Right. Interesting. And what what motivated you to actually pursue this topic? Uh, because, you know, you've dedicated about seven years to it now. Yeah, so um, this actually began as a, as a personal question uh, when my own Afro-Caribbean parent expressed ambivalence toward this HPV vaccine over 15 years ago when it was first approved by the Food and Drug Administration in the US. And that led me to explore questions about HPV as an undergraduate at McGill and then for my MA work and ultimately my PhD in, in a much different um, and more capacious transnational sense. So, you know, it's, it's, it's felt like, and it's been close to 12 years that I've been writing about HPV. And as much as I felt done with it after my MA, it wasn't done with me. And it's funny how these things work because there was so much left for me to understand contextually as it pertained to the Caribbean and about suspicions, connections to economic and political and socioeconomic issues that, that transcended the HPV vaccine. Right. No, that's, that's fascinating. I like how you uh, emphasized or qualified that it, it wasn't done with you, even though yeah. you may have been done with it. Uh, and as a kind of a maybe more technical question, do you have any, or is there anything about research or writing or publishing that you've learned in this long process from, I guess, the your PhD work up till now that you wish you'd known beforehand or any advice you might have for anybody? Yeah, I mean, I think how iterative it all is, uh, the way the PhD is set up, and I think our academic system in general, you know, coursework followed by a year of reading for comprehensive exams, and then the dissertation proposal and the research and the writing, that meant that when I first went to Barbados, I had a sense that I knew the field of transnational feminism right after completing coursework and, and comprehensive exams and also Caribbean studies and science and technology studies. I had my research questions that I had to draft and how to approve for ethics, you know, and I thought, okay, yeah, I'm good to go. All I need now is, is some answers. And I quickly learned how iterative it, it, it was through you know, my relinquishing of control and acknowledging that in, in the case of this research, it was the Afro-Barbadians with whom I was speaking that were offering the theory, right? Their theory in the flesh, their lived realities. It was them who offered me suspicion. This is not my term. It was through their suspicion that I was able to understand 
ambivalence towards the vaccine and so much more. And the same is true for when I returned to Toronto and had to start writing my dissertation. And then the same is true for reworking the dissertation into a book, right? Through it all, I learned sometimes the hard way, the power of just relinquishing control to the process that is iterative and non-linear, despite all these structures and very, very real time and resource constraints that um, students and researchers have that would seem to suggest otherwise, that would seem to, to suggest that it's linear and, um, and simple. Yeah, and we, we want it to be linear and simple. You know, we want to lay out a plan and have everything fall in place when uh, what I'm hearing from you here is that, no, in fact, we have to learn to be very adaptive to what might occur, uh, learn how to roll with the punches, so to speak, uh, and let that inform, you know, what we write and what we actually produce, um, which I think, which is advice that I have very much, um, it hits close to home for me. Um, mm -hmm. So and in terms you know, of that process. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, yeah, <laughs> we can go on, on and on about that and, and PhD research uh, for a while, I'm sure. Um, but in terms of, of content, uh, to jump more into the, I guess, the flesh and bones of the text itself, uh, you make a very strong case about there being a distinction between vaccine hesitancy and vaccine suspicion or, or su suspicion of vaccines that you just mentioned was a term that was given to you. Uh, and can you elaborate on this distinction between vaccine hesitancy uh, or maybe being anti-vax and being suspicious? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I can break that down into two different answers because I think we should differentiate between hesitancy and anti-vax just as we should differentiate between hesitancy and suspicion. Yeah, so, good point, good point. And as you said, right, it, it's it's not so much about me as it is about this distinction that Barbadians have made between hesitancy and suspicion. So suspicion is a vernacularized framing of, of hesitancy, which is a term that's used by medical professionals increasingly from about the year 2011, and which refers to folks who are thought to lie on this continuum between complete acceptance and refusal of vaccines and should be diagnosed, is this the term that the WHO used initially for the specific determinants of their hesitancy. So that could be um, a perceived lack of value that's placed on vaccines, a perceived lack of need for vaccines or access to vaccines or distrust in vaccines or you know, your healthcare provider. Suspicion is much more capacious and generative in that it's asking of something more. Suspicion is not an end point, right? It's potentially a starting point for a different type of healthcare promotion. And when we understand suspicion as affective rather than as an intentional form of resistance, it ultimately complicates narratives around the same as simply irrational refusals. Um, of biomedical care or of refusals that are based in public misunderstandings of science. And, you know, we see or come to appreciate instead that in the context of post-colonial Barbados, as Afro-Barbadian suspicion attaches to things like the capitalist interest behind the pharmaceutical promotion of the vaccine to young Black girls in particular, to historical tropes of hypersexuality, we come to, to see the, the historical tropes of this term hesitancy, right? And that is specifically histories of racialized science in the 21st century and afro Barbadians warranted concerns of these. Um, as parents repeatedly expressed to me, suspicion is protective and it, it's prudent. And then in terms of thinking about anti-vax or anti-vaccination discourse and suspicion, I guess your, your question was, what's the difference between these two, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, there's a frequent conflation. I think in the past two years with the COVID-19 pandemic, 
a lot of folks are familiar with these terms now, vaccine hesitancy and, and anti-vaccination. And there is a frequent conflation, I think, between anti-vaccination and hesitancy, which is problematic because, so the anti-vax movement, which as the name suggests, is against vaccination, um, is often associated with the 1998 Wakefield Lancet study and its accompanying scandal, which fraudulently showed links between autism and the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. And even though Wakefield, this doctor, and the study and the science behind it have been widely discredited, these laid the claim, sorry, these claims laid the foundation for the formation of many contemporary anti-vaccination groups and a broader movement across the UK and North America. But this study was by no means the beginning of this anti-vaccination sentiment, right? A lot of scholarship has looked into the history of, of this type of sentiment um, across the US and Europe. Works like Alana Conis, Vaccine Nation, um, and Durbach's Bodily Matters really explore this anti-vaccination movement in more detail. But vaccine hesitancy, as, as I kind of mentioned, refers to this delay in acceptance or complete refusal. So hesitancy does not equate with anti-vaccination sentiment. And it doesn't, it also doesn't mean that one might not accept. You can you can be vaccine hesitant and accept a vaccine. In my work, I speak to the problems of conflating suspicion specifically with anti-vaccination sentiment. One, because suspicion is not a no, it's not a refusal, though it might engender it. So you again, you might attach suspicions to a vaccine, suspicions might attach to the vaccine, but you uh, might accept it. That was the case for one of the parents that I interviewed. But conflating the two terms also dangerously ignores these histories and voices of the Afro-Barbadians with whom my book is concerned, right? Uh, it ignores all those histories that I've alluded to and all these injurious histories, the uncharacteristic way that the vaccine was promoted across the island through the use of media and pharmaceutical companies um, and related histories of biomedical experimentation on black women in the Caribbean and in the African diaspora um, from time, right? So again, if we are understanding suspicion as affective rather than a form of strategic resistance, we can see how clearly different it is to something like anti-vaccination sentiment. And right. I would also add, the last thing I'd say is that, you know, almost all the parents whom I interviewed who expressed suspicion toward the HPV vaccine for their teenagers accepted all previous pediatric vaccines for their children. So you know, it's really just not black and white. Yeah, and I think that that's a good distinction between uh, a calculated refusal to have a vaccine versus what you describe as an effective response to it. And this affect, and this is something that I got when reading the book, that I, that I understood when reading the book, is that this affective response is going to be influenced by various histories that might not be totally um, available to the people. That is, they might not have the language to necessarily say, this is why I feel this way. It is because of systemic forms of biomedical oppression or histories of colonial violence that I feel this way. Nevertheless, the effective uh, response communicates that to some extent. Absolutely. Yeah. That's fascinating. Uh, and in the book, you stress that HPV vaccines are safe and effective, of course, to prevent HPV and therefore reduce the risk for men and women uh, or boys and girls uh, to develop HPV related cancer later in life. At the same time, you are seeking to avow people who refuse to vaccinate themselves and their children. So why do you think it's important to maintain both positions to say that, you know, we know that these vaccines are effective, they're safe, uh, and they're really they're good in every way, shape and form, but also leaving room to acknowledge suspicion, uh, to acknowledge these effective responses to the vaccine. Yeah, um, thanks for that question. In all the interviews that I've done about this book, there's something that I say, and I'm just sticking to it. And it's that this book offers a shift from 
merely looking at Afro-Barbadians or hesitancy in Barbados to looking from Afro-Barbadian suspicion. Their corporeal traces, the unsettling truths that suspicion holds and the ways in which suspicion calls our attention to the need to make our relations of care and science more accountable. So suspicion like vaccine hesitancy is context and location specific, though not necessarily bound. So it's just exceedingly important for me to emphasize this so that we don't neutralize the significance and potentially transformative nature of suspicion for Afro-Barbadians, right? That is to say my argument in this book is not that all people who are suspicious of vaccines are warranted in their suspicions, but rather it's to offer suspicion again as a very um, specifically Afro-Barbadian vernacularized framing of hesitancy in relation to the HPV vaccine and to trace how suspicion is a residue of so much which we ought to be taking into account in our public health efforts to promote technologies like vaccines with transparency and accountability and cultural sensitivity, right? Certainly if we read suspicion for its transnational implications, we might better be able to look at racialized and marginalized communities in places like Canada and the US and contextualize these populations hesitancy towards specific vaccines like the COVID-19 vaccine in light of things like government neglect and pharmaceutical injustice and greed, medical racism and more. And ultimately what, what this does is it emphasizes the continuities of that which we are all too often quick to call historical and the past and think that this only refers to things like Tuskegee syphilis experiments when in fact, the pandemic we're living through right now is shining a light on how present these injustices are for marginalized groups. So I guess to summarize what I just said, it, it is important to maintain these positions and it is also important to recognize the specificity of something like hesitancy and certainly suspicion in relation to particular vaccines and populations. Yeah, and I completely agree. And at the beginning of uh, your response there, you mentioned that it's important to look at it from the perspective of, in this case, Barbadian women mostly and Barbadian girls, not from the perspective uh, of someone from the outside, mm -hmm. which is often a perspective that just takes the stance or assumes the stance that these people are just irrational or these yeah. people are just uneducated. And if only we could educate these people then all of the problems will go away. And of course, you can't just educate uh, past historical intergenerational trauma away. You, can, you can't just uh, send people to school and have that go away. So That's how it. does suspicion um, present the opportunity maybe for a kind of care or a kind of uh, community care or treatment of, of care that is different than the kinds of care, I quote unquote, care that is employed by pharmaceutical companies or by, by governments. Yeah, so again, in Barbados, for Afro-Barbadians, suspicion is asking for, and this is my argument in the book, a form of radical care, a different type of, of health care that transparently engages with communities' concerns through things like participatory action research, that critiques the inadequacy of biomedical models of care for Afro-Caribbean women in particular, especially as it relates to things like the body and sex and a type of healthcare that models if more effective forms of disease prevention across community and national levels. And these are forms of healthcare and community organizing for which there are actually precedents in Barbados and the Caribbean. And I discussed some of this in the book in terms of Caribbean feminist healthcare organizing through groups like the Women in Development Unit in the 1970s. If we were to look in a transnational perspective, we can look to groups like the Black Panthers and the clinics that they established to serve those most neglected by the state. And when we fail to recognize and attend to these considerations that these community members are offering and seeing that they need, 
it ultimately diminishes the efficacy of government public health efforts, and it continues to erode the public's trust in its governments and medical institutions. So, you know, hesitancy is often named as one of the top threats to global health. I think it, it, a couple of years ago, the WHO said that. And I would go so far as to argue that it is a failure to address the concerns that lie beneath suspicion and hesitancy that is the threat to public health. Right, right. It's a, it, it, to put it in a way that I understand the most clearly to account for these various histories that lend or that motivate uh, this kind of suspicion, not to just treat the symptom as what should be uh, done away with without getting at the underlying cause, which, you know, uh, are these histories of um, colonial violence as just one possible, one possible factor here. Yeah. Uh, at you least in, they inhere in the present, right? They're not, you know, as Saidiya Hartman says, it's not that Black people are obsessed with bygone days and can't let go of the past, but right, it's yeah. Black the past continues to inhere in the present in so many tangible ways that it is not simply that these are historical harms that need to be recognized, right? We need to be looking at the way that public health and medicine and scientific process continues to um, neglect many and engage in injurious acts even today. Absolutely, absolutely. And one of them being, uh, like, like you just mentioned with the World Health Organization, ignoring uh, all of these other factors and treating only hesitancy as, as the problem here, as, as though these people who are largely victims to various forms of oppression, both historical and ongoing, are the problem. They That's frame it in that way, yeah. which doesn't do anything to actually help the situation very much. And uh, on this channel as well, I've, I've covered many of Sarah Ahmed's texts, and I happen to very much enjoy her work uh, in all its forms. And I was wondering if you could describe uh, her influence on you and her influence on your uh, approach in this text. Yeah, so in this text, I'm trying to understand and offer a consideration of what it means to understand suspicion toward the HPV vaccine as theory and also as something that's empirical, um, as generative, but also fraught and influenced by Ahmed as something that is sticky and contagious. So and it talks about how objects of emotion circulate and how affective contagion is um, influenced through spatial relationships. And I think for me, thinking through a transnational feminist framework, I was really invested in, in why it sticks, like what makes it stick across place, space and time. And from my interviews and engagement with Caribbean feminist transnational scholarship, it became clear uh, that, that this affect of suspicion sticks because it is palimpsestic, because it is embedded within bodies and memories and histories of Afro-Barbadians and their experiences with colonialism in ways that are impossible to let go of. Um, and also, you know, in, in conversation with women of color feminist theory, and not just Ahmed, um, thinking about affect more capaciously in terms of theory in the flesh, right? Lots of scholarship like um, Shari, this is Shari Moraga and Gloria Anzal do his formulation of theory in the flesh um, and, and women of color feminist works that have long thought about affect and emotion that sticks and travels and lingers and remains, but hasn't necessarily been categorized under the canon of affect theory. Yeah, that's great. And I've, I've, I've also covered uh, Ansel Dua's work on here as well. And she figures into my own work as well in, in a similar, in a similar uh, vein, specifically just to mention that briefly, she speaks about in her borderland, she speaks of a, what she calls, um, and my pronunciation is going to be bad, but la faculté, which would be what she describes as an embodied response to what she describes as a moment in which uh, marginalized folks in that setting, Latina women mostly, 
are have their how she describes have their back up against the wall from various forms of oppression they can draw upon la facultad as like a kind of um embodied response almost like a a tactic of survival in mm -hmm. response to that that's right yeah um and i find that i find that stuff <laughs> very fascinating and you, so you mentioned earlier that histories of sexualization specifically the the hypersexualization uh, of young um, black Barbadian girls and young women sort of uh, contributes to um, the ongoing oppression of not only young Barbadian women and girls, but encourages or acts as a, a residue of the history of colonial sexualization that is experienced today in present day Barbados, that is, um, how it is responded to by their many of these black Barbadian girls, how their mothers then respond to uh, the HPV vaccine. How does that history of hypersexualization figure into the, the, the dynamic here? Yeah, so I guess just to give a bit of context, many of the Afro-Barbadian parents with whom I spoke gestured to the promotion of the vaccine, the way that the promotion of the vaccine disconcertingly reproduced stereotypes and pathologies around Black women's hypersexuality in the Caribbean. And this is in part due to the fact that the marketing of the vaccine was done so overwhelmingly as a cervical cancer vaccine, despite the fact that HPV leads to head and neck cancers, penile and anal cancer, genital warts, and more. And with Barbados being a population that is over 90% Black, as I mentioned previously, and the target market for the vaccine initially being young girls and majority Black girls, for many parents, the uncharacteristic marketing of the vaccine through U.S. pharmaceutical ads and foreign doctors coming to Barbados from the Pan American Health Organization to speak about the vaccine and holding town hall meetings and parent-teacher association meetings felt really forceful and unmatched with local norms around healthcare and promotion and vaccine dissemination. So parents used phrases such as, this is being forced down our throats and you know, stop suggesting our girls are overly sexual or engaging in so much sex that they just need this form of protection. And unsurprisingly, the very introduction of the vaccine also invited the circulation of cultural ideologies of gender that, that question the vaccine's appropriateness for the young adolescent girls to whom it was targeted. But again, parents stressed that their suspicion was a lot more complicated than saying they were concerned with respectability politics. So in chapter three, I talk about how we can't lose sight of the ways that really well-established gendered ideologies in the Anglophone Caribbean um, are such that women's sexuality and sex and its risks are always being policed by masculinity and to wholly conflate or subsume narratives of suspicion within this paradigm of respectability really loses sight of the more insidious and nuanced ideologies that are at play and then also the um, similarly complex understandings of respectability that parents were bringing to the fore in their elaborations about their suspicions. Right. And the same kinds of suspicions or concerns, because you mentioned earlier uh, in your response there, that uh, even though the HPV vaccine would work to prevent against cervical cancer, it would also protect against possible anal cancer or uh, penile cancer. And so you emphasize in the text how the same kind of uh, concern wasn't extended to young boys, as though there was a concern about uh, young boy hypersexuality within Barbados. Yeah, so this is something that nurses speculated because the vaccine was eventually opened up to young boys and parents and nurses said that they did not see parents have the same type of ambivalence, but it's it's really not as simple as that and much more difficult to say because, again, there was a long period of time between the initial 
promotion and release of the vaccine to the Barbadian public and the opening of the vaccine to boys. So, you know, time could be a factor there. And in general, nurses and adolescents had a much more simplistic understanding or narration of what they felt parents' suspicions were about than parents themselves. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Yeah, I, I, when I was reading that, I was just impressed with the, <laughs> you taking all of these different angles and really considering these different um, differing responses that people had from nurses to Barbadian women uh, and so on. And toward the end of the book, you present the experience of one white Barbadian woman named Elizabeth, whose daughter named Tara supposedly suffered side effects from the HPV vaccine. Now beforehand, Elizabeth did not have what you describe and what other Barbadian women described, Black Barbadian women described, as a gut feeling of suspicion to toward the vaccine. So how does race in this context possibly affect people's perception of vaccines and their responses to biomedical interventions? Yeah, so I'll note that neither did she have these gut feelings um, after her daughter's negative experience is with the vaccine, but that her growing sense of empathy, I guess, as a parent toward other Afro-Barbadian parents who refused the vaccine was noteworthy, right? As was her lack of um, distrust toward the Ministry of Health, the Barbadian government, her pediatrician, all despite the fact that she disagreed with them about the cause of her daughter's sudden and extensive list of medical conditions in the wake of receiving the first dose of the HPV vaccine. So in the book, I describe that as an upper middle class, um, as an upper class white Barbadian, her sustained faith in the government and the medical community and even the vaccine itself exists in in stark contrast to many of the Afro-Barbadian parents I interviewed for whom these legacies of biopolitical and necropolitical care related to the medical institution weighed so heavily as residue. And this is just not a residue for her and her family and by vernacularly, vernacularly reframing hesitancy as suspicion, what Afro-Barbadians throughout the book are doing is emphasizing how histories of colonialism and capitalism in the Anglophone Caribbean, of which science and medicine are an integral part, remain persistent and pertinent. And despite this newfound sense of empathy, this parent, Elizabeth, still by and large refused the understandings of suspicion and protection that Afro-Barbadians in the book spoke of in ways that really accentuated for me the racial dimensions of suspicion and the connected forms of biopolitical refusals, which the Afro-Barbadian parents in the book detail for us. Right, and this is something that was certainly and still is very much ignored by these same government officials, government bodies, uh, biomedical, pharmaceutical companies who just treat the population as a homogenous mass that doesn't account for differing histories and differing ongoing experiences of oppression and, and real lived experiences of oppression that might motivate uh, concern or hesitancy, suspicion, or suspicion, I really should say, of vaccines in differing contexts. Exactly. Uh, and maybe just as a if you, final question, if you could maybe elaborate on what you describe at the very end of the book as, and you mentioned this earlier briefly, but what maybe a, 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 an approach of radical care might look like in helping to, uh, you know, encourage vaccine, uh, vaccine, um, people to get vaccine while while also acknowledging uh, the ways that suspicion acts as an effective response to uh, ongoing and past forms of oppression. Yeah, I mean, what Afro-Barbadian parents showed me is that this is ultimately a form of care that happens outside of major 
attempts to promote a pharmaceutical technology outside something like a pandemic and is really an everyday form of care with the population through things like participatory action research, as parents shared with me, through, you know, really old school grassroots tactics of knocking on people's doors if they want to share information about new campaigns related to technologies or drugs that is not a big media blitz and something that's promoted through U.S. pharmaceutical advertisements and that's essentially rooted in long-term transformative and accountable forms of healthcare. No, that's that's fantastic, and that really seems like a like a very good strategy to employ, and a very good point for us to close out here. So I want to extend my thanks to you, Dr. Charles, for coming and talking about your book, and I highly recommend anyone go and buy it. You'll be able to find a link for it in the description. I promise you won't be disappointed. Uh, and yeah, thank you very much for coming, and for everyone who listened, thank you for listening. You can leave a comment. You can. Uh, leave a like if you'd like. And on that note, goodbye, everyone.